Welcome to the Intercut Podcast, the weekly show going over the TV, movies, and entertainment that people can't cut away from. I am your co-host, Zachary Shevich, and joining me from the moment pictures were born, Ooh. he had skin in the game, Let's it's Arturo go. Zarita. Yeah, talking nothing but the top 10 of the year with some of the best people to talk movies with. Uh, it has been 365 days of new movies. Theaters are back, baby. Streaming services are a go. Mm -hmm. You can watch things mm -hmm. on your phone. You can watch things off your hands like Spielberg is showing you. Uh, there's so many ways to watch <laughs> movies this year. Uh, and I'm very curious to see what the three of us end up putting on our top tens, what, we, what, uh, what ends up correlating the most. Yeah, we are continuing our annual tradition. We got to bring the crew back for our best of lists. And most people in the world are not her soulmate, but we're always glad to have Amanda the Jedi joining us for another best of the year list. How's it going, Amanda? How was your 2022 of movie watching? A lot better than 2021. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. And a little yeah. better than I 2020. Like, I feel like we're getting, I feel like we got a lot of like, long delayed projects or, or projects that people finally got to really put their full artistic weight behind this year. We got a lot of really, really interesting films this year. We did this at our halfway point as we always do. And when we did our best movies of the year so far video, I asked both of you what percentage of your list did you see on the big screen versus on streaming. Now that the year's almost up, I'm curious again, because for me, I saw 70% of my top 10 and more than half of my honorable mentions in a theater. Amanda, you were about 50-50 six months ago. Where do you think you're at right now? 60-40. Theaters? Yeah, 60% yeah, 60 theater. Let's go. Big screen. That was pretty good. Arturo, I'm assuming it's going to be the same for you. We got 20% iPad. I'm looking at some iPhone <laughs> stuff right here. I got 7 out of 10 in theaters. But a lot of those movies, it's not just 7 out of 10 in theaters. It's multiple times. It's traveling across states for some of these. So uh, mm -hmm. I I'm glad to have added new theaters to my list. So that that's a nice happy stat for me. Mm. What movies were you upset that you maybe didn't get to catch? You know, we're talking about the best movies of the year, but we can't catch them all. We do. I think all of us are, are in the hundreds, but there's still some stuff that slips through the cracks. Are, is there anything that you, you didn't watch Not before Kahnemal we Zach. got to put this list Kahnemal together? Zach. Every single one. There's every single movie. There's one indigenous film that might come out next year that I, I will catch. But I think for the most part, I was able to catch everything, but a little of the shortlist ones from the Oscars this year. So there's a couple of uh, foreign films, some of which are going to be playing at Sundance that got shortlisted this year. So yeah. that's, that's what I'm looking forward to the most. It's TV where I lagged. Y'all got me on TV. Mm. We'll get there. Uh, but yeah, I, I felt very on top of the film world this year. But like you, it's mostly those international films uh, like All Quiet on the Western Front, Oscar. Broker, Close, that I, I wish I caught, but I haven't yet had the chance to. I'll, I'll hopefully get to them soon. Uh, Amanda, was there anything that you wanted to see but didn't get to by the time we put this list together? This is the most shocking one for me. Uh, Clerks 3. I haven't seen Clerks 3 yet. And like Clerks is one of my favorite movies of all time. <laughs> I'm very surprised you didn't see that. I've been you waiting to Smith like and the love that watch one got it. You got the movie shirt and everything. I know. I've been like waiting to watch it on like a big screen, and then it just didn't happen because I kept like getting delayed. Mm. And then it got down to this, and I'm like looking at my list of things to watch, and like Clerks three is just this glaring thing at the top of the list, <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit! And then I just didn't have time to get to it. It's the only one that's not even yeah, in the text body. It's the whole heading, just Clerks 3 ways <laughs> to be watched. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that one I think came out around the time of TIFF. And, yes. and I, I know that was a busy time for me. I'm sure it was a really busy time for you as well. And it was well, a fast one too, which really sucked with its initial release yeah. because... Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. if you were lucky enough to see it with, with Kevin, I'm sure that was awesome because I, I hear the way he tours his movies is like the best way to catch him, so... I really Maybe assumed he would have tur turned we'll, we'll up. Yeah, I would... I really would. I really assumed he was going to turn up cool. um, at, around TIFF. Like I figured that they would have tried to hit Toronto when TIFF was happening. So my plan mm -hmm. was like, oh, I'll catch it then. Nowhere, nowhere near Toronto. Just nowhere. <laughs> yeah, um, I also didn't end up getting to Clerks Three, even though I wanted to. But it, it like Clerks Three, I think there's some stuff that I would have liked, but probably would not have ultimately been on the top ten. Stuff like Confess Fletch Same. or Moon Age Daydream or The Woman King all seemed good. I didn't get around to seeing them. 
My main regret from movie watching in 2022 is not re-watching some movies that I liked, but that I might grow to love. Movies like Decision to Leave, mm. Kimmy, After Sun, Glass Onion, basically all the films on my honorable mentions. I, I feel like those are films that when I redo this list in a year's time or something, they might work their way into that top 10. I see. Yeah, for me, it was a lot of the documentaries. I decided for uh, the halfway point, I had two on there. I moved all of my docs off. So practically, like mm. anything that I'd have to recommend that's like really good that it feels off of a lot of people's radar would be docs like Clay Dream. That could be a narrative in and of itself. Like Dear Mr. Mm. Brody, watch the doc before that becomes like an Oscar winning thing and they just find the perfect person to cast. I want Fassbender. Uh, we met in virtual reality. It's <laughs> going to be the future of movies. Fire of Love is probably one of the best IMAX movies in a year where we had brand new filmmakers working mm. on IMAX. And then the Pez Outlaw, I think, had one of the best narratives of this year that it, it damn near could have competed with the other features and wasn't in my top 10 for a little bit, but I put those to the side. So I'm glad that with streaming, I think people have been able to test out more shorts, more miniseries, a lot of new things that I think people usually wouldn't watch in the past. And I think that's been one of the best things of this hybrid way of being able to watch new movies now. Definitely. Well, in a little bit, we'll get into those best movies of 2022 list. But first, make sure you're subscribed to the Intercut Podcast, either the video podcast on YouTube.com slash Intercut Pod or the audio feed available on most podcatchers. Also, you can follow Intercut across social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We are at Intercut Pod. That's at Intercut P-O-D. And that's short for podcast. We are, we are also Intercut Pod on Patreon, where you can support the show for as little little as one dollar a month and also be sure to leave us that much requested five star review on apple podcast it makes me happier than talking about my favorite things from 2022 all right let's not delay let's get into the top 10 lists amanda why don't you do us the honors being our guest kick us off what made it to number 10 on your best of 2022 list after much deliberation, I have decided to go with Glass Onion, a <laughs> Knives Out story in the tenth position. It was Ooh. it was going neck and neck with Bullet Train, which I really wanted to nice. put on the list because I feel like it was like an unpopular choice. But uh, Glass Onion, it, it's just super <laughs> fun, you know. Like Ryan Johnson knocked it out of the park again. I don't think it quite hit where the first one did, but I know a lot of people like this one more than the first one. Um, but I, I would say that they're at least like pretty close in quality and, and on even footing, like in, in a lot of ways. It's just super fun, super exciting. And it's a damn travesty that this isn't getting the biggest theatrical release. I agree. This is right at my number 11. I had it on my list as well. And I am one who likes it even more than the first one. I think this has some of the oh. most interesting characters. I agree with Zach. This is one of those where I'm going to be on my third watch hitting myself in the head going, dummy, this was clearly in the top six at least. So uh, I'm looking forward <laughs> to rewatches on this because the way that he approached this one, it's like he really knew that you not only knew murder mysteries, he already knew you'd seen Knives Out and he was ready to play with you. So I I'm just excited on, on a rewatch to catch how he set up all the pieces and then the camera movements that he had in this one were no joke. It's some of my favorite cinematography of the year as well. It's just very exciting that he delivered something that is so different in its own way, but true to the first one. Like, this is kind of what a sequel for a big blockbuster movie should be. Something that stays true to the feeling of the original, but gives you something that's completely fresh in its own right, too. So I think it's evidence that Ryan Johnson's one of our great filmmakers working right now, and Makes me just that much more excited to stay in the Knives Out universe yep. uh, again. And I want to rewatch that too. So Glass Onion, a great way to kick off our top tens. Arturo, what do you have at your number 10? Uh, it was much deliberation, but I made sure that there were no ties. So my honorable mentions before we mentioned was Glass Onion. It was Marcel the Shell with Shoes On did not make it. I was really hoping. So that's my shout out for my best animated movie of the year. Right on the cusp of it. I figured Zach was not going to allow this one. Rathaniel is a stand-up show, so that also it has to have an honorable mention. I don't know where to put it. Uh, how am I supposed to give yeah. a shout out to one of my most rewatched it's, specials of the year? It's not going on TV. Can't go in movies. It's the number one in some list. So it has to be mentioned know. right here. But I begin my list yeah. with a little movie that we saw at the New York Film Festival almost knocking out because this movie dragged so long, but it has haunted me with one frame, a stare that the two main actresses give to each other. The French submission of this year, St. Omer. Omer. 
Omar. They say it a bunch of different ways in the movie, but when I tell you that this is one of the most exhilarating dramas of the year, one that the behind the scenes story has a director going to an actual court case where she was the person who was keeping notes of a mother who may have reportedly, allegedly, supposedly drowned a daughter <laughs> whom no one knows about. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It is one of the twistiest, one of the most patient drama court thrillers that I have seen in a long time. And like I said, if you have the patience for it towards the end of it, the way that the script lays everything out is profound to a degree that while I know it may not be everybody's cup of tea, I would be shooting myself if I look back 10 years from now and did not mention St. Omer, one of the best movies out of New York, one of the best movies of the year. Yeah, uh, that's one that I, again, really, really want to get a rewatch in because it is so stunning. And I think it does kind of like embed itself in your brain. There's so much haunting about that film. I, I can't wait to get a chance to watch it again. But, you know, in a, in a year that was pretty stacked when it comes to French cinema, we talked about how much we liked Athena pretty recently on Intercut Pod. Yep. We uh, talked about uh, Happening, one of the stunning films that we saw back at Sundance earlier this year. I feel like St. Omer is the one that resonates the most and, and sticks with me the most. It's a really, really amazing film. I left it off my list because, oh, I mean, I don't th know if it would make my top 10. It is technically like got one of those, is it 2022, 2023 things? But yeah. it, it's, it's a submission for 22. It's doing the rounds and it's great. It, so uh, hopefully more people will uh, get to see it another too. one that I think is going to be on your list. So that's when I knew it needed to be on my top 10 because there's another female centric one. And I ended up thinking about St. Omer just a little bit more. But we'll get to that one later on. In the mm, that, interesting. What did you do interesting. At, at number 10? All right, my, my number 10 is a film that I have watched it slowly creep up my, my larger list. And it's a movie that I, I liked a lot when I first saw it, but I find myself thinking about it again and again, reading more and more pieces about it. And even though I know there's some interesting arguments against the film, Armageddon Time has really, really resonated with me. And I, I find the story that they're trying to tell that James Gray is piecing together about his childhood and about equity and, and class in uh, in a shifting time in the American landscape to be a really fascinating and singular one, one that really, really just resonated with me and, and, and struck a chord to uh, with how I feel just about... <laughs> the the political spectrum in America and, and my my own heritage and things like that. There's just a lot of really interesting material to chew on. And I, while it's not a movie that necessarily blows you away from like open to close, I think if you are willing to really dive into what is he trying to wrestle with, what are the issues that are being addressed in this film, even if they're not necessarily addressed in the perfect way. I just, I like a film that is that rewarding and merits going back to it and produces so many good pieces of writing about it. I, I it's a film that I've just thought about way more than I expected to after I first saw it. So I, I got Armageddon time sneaking into my top 10. Nice. Beautiful. It's a lot of those movies this year that I think it's like directors just looking back. Zach was mentioning earlier that we felt like we got a lot of people's greatest works. I think it's because in 2020, they thought the gig was up, dude. I think uh, you could tell mm -hmm. a lot of people came in to swing uh, for a movie as if like theaters were no longer yeah. going to be a thing. And you mentioned that one that gets very personal. Bardo gets probably too personal. We have a couple movies in this list mm -hmm. where it's directors looking back on themselves uh, and just putting it all up on the big screen. Yeah, a lot of filmmakers decided that if they only get a chance to make one more movie, they'll do it in 2022. I like that. They need to continue uh, Amanda, that. Amanda, what filmmaker's vision made it to your number nine on your list? My number nine is Tar. And I don't know if that's further up on your list, Zach, because I know you mentioned that yes. you had it. It is further up for further sure. Up. Yeah. So we'll, we'll wait to talk about it. But this was like my, this is the last thing yeah. I watched before we recorded this because I knew it was going to hit my list. But uh, I'm so glad you did. It certainly 
hit expectations and uh it's one of those ones that's really interesting to look at and kind of compare to something like whiplash because it's almost like you're getting a flip side of a coin in certain ways um so i thought that was a super fun one but we will talk about it more later that would have been in my top 20 that would have been the the one that saint omer just beat out just by a little bit but tar is tar is one that the more that you rewatch it you start seeing it's a whole musical piece it's Mm -hmm. it's a Mm -hmm. smart one I uh, will definitely talk more about Tar later on in this video. Art, right, what do you have at number nine? I've got one that tar. repeats the title three times. Got to see it at South By with most of the cast. It's the thriller Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. The A24 released in the spring, summer. I can't remember when exactly it popped up. Um, it has an original song as well that I know didn't get shortlisted. Sorry, Charlie. Uh, but Bodies, 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 I think <laughs> delivered in being the best satire of the year. I think there were some good ones. I hope I'm not spoiling anyone's list, but like Not Okay from this year, I know it was one that needed a goofy warning at the beginning, but it ended up helping helping people because they could not realize that the character was supposed to be unlikable. A big part of this is that people, I think, want uh, reality in their movies. They want them to be real. But they don't really care for them to be authentic, right? This is how these uh, individuals would act in this scenario, who are spoiled, who mm-hmm. are kind of all one up in each other. And I thought it was a really great way of not just directing the cast that they had with them, a bunch of great up-and-comers. This is that movie where we already know Zach's been watching Industry. We already know with Rachel Sennett, a lot of really great up-and-coming uh, performers from this one. But it's just beautifully put together and I think really comments on the generation of today and paranoia. And uh, every time I, I rewatch it, I catch something new and I think it's a hilarious, hilarious movie. Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. One of my favorites of this year. Amanda, what did you think of Bodies, Bodies, Bodies? I don't think we got a chance to talk with you about it. I shockingly didn't love it as much as I thought I was going to, so I need to watch it again because, like, on paper, it (laughs) sounds like the perfect movie for me. It sounds like there was nothing that should have pleased me more. This should have been in my top three. I don't know why. I think I need to catch it again, but, like, you know, I I saw it, like, it was... I saw it, like, day one, and when I was in Montreal, I went to a theater. It was really nice all by myself. Like, and I just... I don't know. Maybe I went in with expectations too high. Uh, That's probably, Mm. yeah. But... Bodies, 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 yeah. too? I got you. We'll, we'll all go out to the South Pass for <laughs> Hell yeah. Exactly, yeah. No, I, I had fun with bodies, 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 and uh, I've had the chance to revisit it a couple times, and I do think it really does reward uh, getting into some of the analysis of what they're trying to say and what they're trying to depict and really paying attention to how often they're holding cell phones and how integral that technology is. It It's fun, but I also see the ways in which, for some people, it it's like too on the nose uh but for me it worked so uh we'll, we'll see maybe your mirror rewatch changes your opinion or maybe you end up just liking it even less but yeah. uh, bodies 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 yeah. makes arts number nine my number nine is something that did not make arts list although only narrowly i have marcel the shell oh. with shoes on uh yeah i, I kind of Love this little Beautiful. delight from A24 and Dean Fleischer Camp. Uh, I think it's just got this this very big heart that is kind of undeniable. And the way that it's able to kind of help you see the world almost in a different way is the type of things that you want from a film, I feel like. like especially an animated film to give you sort of a different visual perspective on the world that also ends up going beyond that and ends up resonating a little bit emotionally. I I just think there's, there's something really magical in how that, that this, in how this film is put together. There's something that's so scraggly to it. Whereas you look at like the Pixar films or the DreamWorks films, and they're so perfectly crafted to be wonderful diversions for children. And this is so much more like innocent seeming and and, and weird and and just offbeat. And I love that about it. I love how how, uh, idiosyncratic a lot of its little decisions and details are. And I think it really does reward paying attention to all those decisions, all those little bits they've added to the frame are. It's just such a heartwarming film and one of the films that made me happiest this year. So Marcel the Shell with shoes on, I got a number nine. Let's go back to Amanda and see what she has at number eight. Uh, my number eight is On the Count of Three. So this was a 2020 Sundance, 2021 Sundance, sorry, 2021. 
and uh, I just like really fell in love with it. It's uh, it's I can't necessarily recommend it for everyone. I feel like if you're someone who's maybe going through some things, this movie might actually be really mm-hmm. helpful for you. Or this could be like the worst movie you could ever watch in that uh, situation. <laughs> but it's uh, you know, starring Christopher Abbott, Gerard Carmichael, uh, just really solid performances out of both of them, and just like the general premise, so you know what you're getting into. It's basically you know two friends decide that they want that they're gonna this is gonna be their last day, and at the end of the day, they're they're gonna kill each other. They're gonna like one, two, three shoot each other at the same time. Um, so this is mm-hmm. like their last day to do anything that they wanted to do. Um, and it's really funny in areas and it's really moving in other areas. Uh, but then it's also obviously very hard to watch based on that premise. I love how you said it. Uh, I once recommended waves to somebody and they were in a like sibling relationship that probably wasn't the best. And I was like, man, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have recommended that to you. They're like, yeah, it really hit. This is that movie for this year. And I agree that it goes to places that are really dark, but Christopher Abbott, whoa, does he hold this movie together? Um, I, I had Rathaniel mm-hmm. on my list, so obviously I'm, I'm a big fan of Gerard. I do feel like the the reason it was like right on my honorable mentions is he's doing that like stand-up bit where a lot of his lines feels like it's like bits from his stand-up that he comes out as a reaction. But I'm glad that it's on Hulu uncut because this is a movie that I think would have been really uncomfortable to have seen in a theater with a bunch of people. But I, I'm glad he was able to make it because a lot of these elements are, are, are really hard, hard to uh, get funded. On the count of three, I double up that pick, Amanda. Good, good one. Yeah, a recommendation from all three of us. I think we we loved it coming out of Sundance. We've got a review here on the Intercut channel if you want to watch that. I think the thing that really struck us is just that it feels very real. It doesn't feel like they're pulling punches for the sake of making it into a movie. It feels like they actually are contending with the emotions that both of these characters would feel and, and respecting both of their journeys in that sense. So uh, it makes it, my, my <laughs> reaction makes it sound very dour. I think there's a lot of fun to be had in the mm-hmm. film too. But yeah, it, it definitely has that that darker edge to it for sure. So a warning if you're going to check it out, but check it out. It's yeah. a very good Want to see him direct more. Uh, good pick for from Amanda at number eight. I think we're on to Arturo's number eight. Uh, now I believe, because this is my action pick right here. Or one of my action mm-hmm. picks. Some of y'all okay. have another action pick that's got three letters back to back to back. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> correct? Correct. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna keep that talk over there for later. I had okay. to pick this one though because it is the one that I've seen the most screens, and I'm still missing missing one. You could have seen this in Dolby. You could have seen this in IMAX. You could have seen this in Screen X, where they put cameras on the side of damn planes. Top Gun Maverick <laughs> is a movie that just got re released in theaters last week again. Again. That's my number eight movie. There's no need to describe it. <laughs> Let me know, Zach. <laughs> it's top no, I'm glad you had this on I'm glad you had this on your list. I didn't end up putting it on mine, oh, but you, okay. I had a I feeling you'd have it on your Yeah. One of us had Yeah, to. exactly. I mean it's yeah, I mean it's it's the movie theater event of the year in a year with a lot of movie theater events. Crazy. Which, the amount know, of people it's, yeah. it's undeniable. This this mm-hmm. had communists in the theater going, Yeah, let's go, America. It was the craziest movie. Everybody was rooting for this thing. <laughs> I had never seen a movie make so much money and everyone just put whatever they thought of it to the side. They took this home. I it's coming out on Paramount on Christmas Day. So Ooh. out of all of the Paramount movies that were what what did we have earlier this year? A Quiet Place, which was suing because they were going onto Paramount too fast. There was only one person who was able to keep his <laughs> streaming deal the way he wanted it. And now he's got a teaser trailer mm-hmm. for next year's big Tom Cruise movie. So, uh, yeah, for the annual uh, Tom <laughs> Cruise trying to kill himself event of the year, I put yeah. it at number eight. I, I love Top Gun Maverick, but I might like the behind the scenes video for Mission Impossible even more. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's just unbelievable. So I, I'm... Oh. I'm I'm probably putting at the number eight spot one of the highest grossing movies of the year. Yeah, um, a great pick and one that we I think all three of us had it in our best of the year so far video. So I'm glad that it still gets some representation here at the end of 2022. My number eight pick is one that I also think we all had on our lists at the uh, best of the year so far. And I think it's going to show up again later. It is after Yang directed by Kogo Nada. So I'll save the talk for that when we get back to it. And let's circle back around to Amanda's number seven. Zach, we're back to it. We're at after Yang. 
Hey! <coughs> yeah. Beautiful. I, it's always nice when it comes one right after the other. Uh, I guess we can still hold off a little since it's gonna make a third lo- <laughs> it's uh, got appearance. One more coming sounds up, guys. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Art. What do you have at number seven? This is that one pick that we said there's always that scraggler that might just make it, might not. I believe this has already had a couple of New York screenings, and it was one that we were able to catch at New York. It played at Chicago. I believe it is a submission for a country that isn't even a language in the movie. But I have to have to to put Return to Seoul, a movie that follows a Korean uh, I don't, a Korean woman adopted who was by adopted a French by woman. French, yes, parents raised there only yeah. to return to Korea to try to reunite with her family, and then the way the movie ends, you would never expect it to go uh, with her ending up with the job that she ends up with. There are so many themes woven into this movie, not just dealing with language and culture, but just a crazy character development that this. Uh, the, mm-hmm. this character goes through and I loved every bit of it. Uh, Zach and I have tossed around different ideas that we've had about just like the way that it shot, the missing scene of it, what certain, you know, signs mean and represents. And, uh, there's so much to this movie that I love. I believe that this should have a, a, a much wider release, but it is picked up by Sony Pictures Classics. So we'll see yeah. how they uh, end up releasing it out there because that's when you know it's a, it's a sign of a good movie. And that's why I guess my recommendation here, Return to Seoul, one of the best international dramas of the year. And it's owned by like seven different countries, which is kind of funny considering the themes of the movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it very on brand or, or like in the ethos of the <laughs> film for all the co-productions there. It actually just this morning, we're recording on the morning of the uh, Oscar shortlist announcements or on the evening of, I should say. And Return to Seoul is one of the Beautiful. 15 movies that got shortlisted in best As international features. Wait, so what country? We are not the only one. A Cambodia, Cambodia. <laughs> so we're not the only ones recommending it. Um, I think you came out of the film lo- loving it a yeah. little more than I did. And as I've had time to really think on it and, and go back to it, like that's a really great yes. movie. Uh, that's a, It's a really great movie that one that I want to watch again and really dive into because we've talked about how it, so much is reliant on translation in the film and, intentional mistranslation and non-intentional mistranslation and just sort of like miscommunication and and catching all those details I think is going to be really, really rewarding because it's such a fascinating uh, depiction of the search for identity. Yeah. And yeah, uh, that's a great, how, great pick. I'm that's glad how I you feel for uh, decision to leave. It. I feel like I need to see it again to understand little nuances there. Mm-hmm. I know you have one that you're going to mention a little later, an Irish film, one that I want to watch again and hopefully understand those little nuances because when you get that, you love the movie more, but we have so many movies we're just trying to catch mm-hmm. up with once that we barely, us who do this for a living, have the chance to catch it again to be able to uh, see all the little nuances that are in there. But I highly implore Return to Soul to be one of those because, yeah, it's just about finding it. Sometimes you go into these movies just thinking you're not going to give anything back. So when you do, it, yeah, it, 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 it's worth rewatching. So Return to Soul, big thumbs up for that one. All right, a complete U-turn from Return to Soul to my number seven pick, RRR. I don't think this is on either of your lists. That was Amanda, my honorable mention. Are you still going to talk yeah. about it? No, it bopped off mine. All right, well, we are all fans of it. Let's get in the three thumbs. It's it's the most fun I think I've had in a movie this year. I mean, no other film this year features two guys going full speed at each other in a motorcycle, in a horse, and then turning to dive off a bridge so they can simultaneously save a child from a river that's on fire. Don't forget the burning flags. Um, that's the first <laughs> <laughs> That's the first 15 or so minutes of the movie. Yeah. You know, I, I, there was a point where I was wondering, like, am I just buying into hype by leaving RRR so high on my list? And is it just like residual love for the not to not to scene? And then I just remembered all the different badass moments that happen one after the other that they that they do like Rakakuni just as well as everything everywhere all at once in this movie Damn that you. they've got CGI animals and uh, that prison break sequence and just so many incredible, incredible sequences. It's nonstop entertainment. So I'm, I'm happy to have it on my list. I had so much fun with RRR. Yeah. This is the year of the three hour movies. This is one of those. Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's go back to Amanda for her number six. 
you know, I almost lumped this one in with the last one so we could have the, I was going to call it the the after duology and we were going to leave the other after movie off of it. But we're talking Ooh. after Sun <laughs> in the sixth place. Yeah. She had after Sun, after Yang, and after Ever Happy, just so y'all know. <laughs> Those were my top three. And I decided I had to like, you know, give things a chance. But after exactly. Sun and after Yang are like really similar in certain ways and that there are these look back on memories uh, with like a, a different unique perspective. So After Sun is this movie of uh, very personal to the director uh, in which it's basically all taking place with this young girl looking back at the tapes of a family vacation. And then we kind of see her going through it when she was a kid, getting that new framing of, of knowing what the father was probably going through now that she's an adult and versus what she would have missed when she was a child. And it has all those different things about like on, on her end, she's kind of like at that, like an informative age and about to like move on to this next stage in her life. Uh, and then you're also seeing all these struggles uh, from the father played by um, Paul Mezcal, who did fantastic. But Frankie Corio, the girl, just phenomenal performance, mm -hmm. probably the best child yep. actor performance I've seen. And I don't know how long just and it's her first performance. And she. It's so good. There's so much nuance to that role and mm -hmm. all the different things she she does. And I was just blown away by the whole thing. And it's just one of those movies that's really stuck with me since I saw it. And one that uh, I just, I it's kind of like a return to soul where I just want to see it again and again and pick up these little things that I missed and what deeper meaning, what, what things are shown, not said, what's, you know, the subtext of certain things. It's like very, it's a, it's a, it's a hitter. It's a hitter. <laughs> Yeah, it's a movie that I think really, <laughs> it really burrows under your skin. And while I, one of the things that I find really interesting about it is while most of what happens in the movie isn't that sad, it's that pervading sense of melancholy that you can't really escape that makes the movie so special and so unsettling and and really makes that ending and those scenes of Paul Mescal dancing so haunting. You. Uh, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, it's not a movie that I think makes itself obvious in the ways that it's going to impact you, but it really, really does get there. We're in that era where people are realizing that to make a sad movie isn't to look back on a horrible moment. It's to look back on happy moments that you don't get again. Yeah. yeah. Holy so, shit. Well put. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a great pick uh, at number six after Sun. Arturo, what do you have at number six on your list? Uh, my depressing movie of the year. Uh, I watched this drama and then ran it immediately back. It is on Showtime. I believe you could still stream it for free on Hoopla. As They Made Us, a drama that comes from a director who was an actress from The Big Bang Theory, mm. Mayim uh, Bialik, who from what I know, has only dealt with comedy and stuff, and she came in here and made a family drama that just wrecked me. Diana uh, Agron, who some of you may know from several other parts that she's been in, uh, she was just mentioned not too long ago being a, one of our favorites from a couple years ago. <clears throat> what am I blinking? Someone help me. <laughs> Amanda. Shiva Baby, Rachel Sanders. Uh, Shiva, Shiva Baby. Baby, thank you. Uh, here, here she comes in way more serious as the daughter who shares a sibling who both had this bond of trauma living under these overbearing parents but now that they're old will they be there for them is only one coming back and the other one not showing up for it and it just shows you the repercussions of as the title says they made us who they are and just seeing what happens when you um when you get fractured from a from a family at su such a young age uh, i don't know there's so many performances in this that i thought were done extremely well dustin hoffman especially with the way that he's aging in the movie candace bergen just Mm. You ever see a character you just want to strangle so bad, but that just means they're, they're doing, they're hitting something, they're becoming a character. Right. Like, they're not a character at that point, they're a person. She got that here. So I thought this movie hit on all cylinders, and it is easily one of the uh, most intimate little docs that I not I did not expect to resonate with me so much. And it's here at the end of the year. Uh, Marshall, I had a little bit higher than this, but on the rewatches to both towards the end of the year, Marshall ended up just as uh, as an honorable mention, and, and something about the weight of this one stayed with me, even more than Marshall's charm, so. I had to recognize it for that as they made us. That's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see this pick here. It's a pick that I haven't really been seeing on a lot of other lists, but you know, it's, it's always cool to see what are the, the films that end up resonating with you individually, yeah. right? Like part of what makes these lists exciting is like, you got to put your own personal flair if in them. Not, so you have you just your copy pacing. <laughs> 
Exactly, exactly. And uh, so you have your personal champion film there at number six. I've got my own. (laughs) (laughs) I've got the film that I'm championing, the one that I've kind of held close to my heart at number six as well. I'm going with Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes, a movie that I've talked about a bunch here on Intercut, uh, and one that I just really, really love and love revisiting. The film that's about a cafe owner that discovers the TV in his cafe suddenly sees images two minutes into the future. And it's this extremely contained, one-shot, real-time, sci-fi, time travel comedy. It's just so ambitious and so absurd in its uh, in its stacking of elements on top of each other that there's just like a really fun build to the film and a really fun sense of play. It's a little bit short, only about 70, 71 minutes, I believe, mm-hmm. but it just like, it's the perfect kind of bite size sci-fi comedy feature that is so meticulously planned that I'm just taken aback by how hard it feels like it must have been to pull off. Yet they do it on this kind of micro budget and it feels very scrappy and very homemade. And I I don't know, there's just some, there's a quality to it that really, really charmed me, that won me over and that has me trying to recommend it to as many people as I can. So uh, I'm going to be like, I'm going to get on my soapbox for my number six, Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes. Nice. Uh, keep it in your minds. Ca- so catch it good. before the year ends. It's one of the best that this year has to offer. Good credits, too. Should be on Prime. So Yeah. Should be on Prime. Yeah. I think it's on Amazon Prime right now, at least in the U.S. So uh, makes it easy if you haven't caught it yet. All right. So we are at the halfway point. Uh, Amanda, do you want to run through your six through ten really quickly? Okay, so so far I've had uh, yeah. After Sun at six, After Yang at seven, On the Counter three at eight, Tar at nine, and Glass Onion and Knives Out Story at ten. Arturo, how about you? What have you done uh, so going far? Going up, I got ten Saint Omer, Bodies, Bodies, Bodies at number nine, Top Gun Maverick at number seven, Everything Everywhere All at Once, What's After Sun six, at number five, Return to Soul, and As They Made Us at number four. I got Armageddon Time at number 10, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On at number 9, After Yang at number 8, RRR at number 7, and Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes at number 6. We'll get back to our list in just a moment, but first, we'd like to thank the Intercutie patrons, those wonderful people who support our show. They are Ewan, Julieta, Garrett, Tim, Elizabeth, Josh, Ashley, Michael, Matt, and Mr. Kobayashi. Our Academy-level members are Tushar, Marion, Cademan, Connor, Pete, Sean, May, Ricky, and Antonio. And of course, a big thanks to the producer level patrons. They are Awkward and you, Den Veer. Thank you so much for supporting the show and a reminder that you too can become a member at patreon.com slash intercutpod where you can sign up for patron benefits like early access to intercut episodes, early access to episode outlines, access to our private Discord channels, and an invitation to our monthly patron Google meeting where we get to debate about stuff and we'll talk about our favorite movies of the year on the next one. So make sure you head over to patreon.com and become a part of the inner cuties. All right, let's take it back to Amanda and start the top fives with your number five. All right. My number five is everything everywhere all at once. Uh, I don't think there's any shock. Uh, This is just kind of, this is like that movie of the year. This is one of those movies that's kind of covered so many different things. It hits so many different emotions and feels, uh, and it's just really swung for the fences in so many areas. I feel like it put a very unconventional lead character in in a lead role. Usually, you know, the mom is kind of like the background character and like we are front and center. Uh, they made taxes and laundry, mm-hmm. heartwarming and wholesome. And we, we saw Ki Hui <laughs> Ki- 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 Kwan come back after years. And he is just so wholesome. Mm-hmm. And I, I love it. It's just, it's beautiful. I think most people have seen this movie to the point that people were getting the pushback on it. Of the, we're getting the people being like, it's not actually <laughs> that good. But it is actually that good. I had it in the recap right now, but I realized I had it right before. So I'm going to mention it again here. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> that was a part of my uh, top coming up to this too. So it's on Showtime now. And I think that 
the last month, because we're getting into the voting stage, once it comes down to the wire, you realize that people aren't fighting about movies. They're 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 voting. They're they're talking publicity in mm-hmm. terms of like what's going to win the big goal towards the end. So I think that emotion gets put to the side. And this is a movie that's nothing but that. And I think that's what a lot of people have resonated with. And I think it's the kookiness and the idea of just being able to go over the top that people finally feel like it doesn't feel like your standard fare that you've gotten everywhere else. Chances are actually being taken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is kind of stunning to see this film's transformation from plucky underdog to presumed Oscars front runner and the near like universal film Twitter choice for best film of the year. Um, and last it's, been, year? it's weird because I think this is the type of film that doesn't really lend itself well to to overdog status. It feels it has much to be better as the, yeah. the, the underdog. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's left me we don't you know, know what to do. in a weird spot with the film where I love it and it will make another appearance later on this video, you know, uh, foreshadowing, whatever. But I, I do, like there's just this weird militant fan base around it now that that feels so strange uh director the director daniel kwan has gone to twitter nah, to talk about how it that, is no you can't do misrepresentative that misrepresentative of the movie you can't do that at that point you know it's gotten too big when people don't even talk about the movie anymore they talk about the fan base of the movie yeah yeah it's, it's massive true. it's it's weird it's weird but i mean it does it does it's a thing that does end up really like coming to the fore, especially in award season and Oscars race, when, like you were saying, Arturo, it becomes not just like, I don't like this movie. It's, I don't like this movie because I like this other movie better. I'm going to take it back. You know what? The, they do actually do have a problem. I've never seen fans <laughs> complain about another movie. No, they're not doing that. They're complaining about their own movie, about their own supporting actresses. They eat themselves alive. <laughs> That's what's so crazy about this yeah. movie. People are so passionate about it. They're belittling the actresses competing within their own movie. So you got to love that. This movie is everything. It's everywhere. All at once at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's too good. Okay, Art, from everything, everywhere, all at once to what at your number five? Well, it would have been everything, everywhere, all at once. That w- that's what it would have been. I had I had oh. skipped it in the recap. Okay. I had technically had it right underneath as they made us, but I could play I could play both of them there. So everything, everywhere, all at once, doubled up there. What's your number five? Okay, uh, my number five is one that is going to make a list, uh, appearance higher on your list. It is the Fablemans. So I'll wait for you to thing. bring it up uh, to get into it. Let's go back to Amanda for her number four. Uh, this is a completely new one for me. It's going to shock a lot of people. Uh, we got Dinner in America for like the third year in a row. What? This one, this one really? was a 2020, 2020 Sundance movie. Uh, but it's finally actually out on streaming services. You can actually see it in America. It had so many distribution issues, but it finally released. Uh, and a perfect timing because Kyle, Kyle <laughs> Gallner is just blowing up again. So good for him. But uh, yeah, I've yes, talked sir. about this one so much. It's this this cute, wholesome little punk rock <laughs> movie. It is equal parts like wholesome and adorable while also being just so aggressive and abrasive in other ways. Uh, I think it's a ton of fun. Uh, I've anytime I recommend it, I get so many people saying that they're like that they loved it. So it's definitely if, if the synopsis seems cool to you, I would definitely check it out. You're the only one who caught it in theaters, I think. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, I caught it in theaters at, at Sundance. Sundance. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of the few people in the world. <laughs> you were the only theatrical one. There you go. There's just me. <laughs> I'm surprised. By, by the time next year, when you put it in, obviously, it's number four spot again. Uh, I'm hoping that they at least start production on Dinner in America. To Supper in America, at least. Something. <laughs> Considering that this came out Sundance 2020, <laughs> and we do not only a best of the year, but a best partway through yeah. the year... This might be its sixth appearance <laughs> on your best of Whoa. list. Are you not including the best it's... of for Sundance? Because that would make yeah, it seven. We've, I've talked about it at <laughs> right, least right. seven or eight times on this channel. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and then all the times it's been on my channel. I can't wait till it's a TV series. Yeah. And then it, we could uh, do the TV miniseries, Dinner in America. It would lend itself well to a television show. It would lend itself well. There you go. <laughs> there we go. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I have seen, you know, there, there are these people who pop up and are like, Dinner in America was the best movie I've ever seen. And yeah, th- so for people who love this movie, they really, really love this movie. Well, I'm glad go. that it is finally, finally available after all the years of recommending it from Amanda. We, we all got uh, our personal picks. Fun this one year. for sure. Can't wait to see it next year. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Okay, all right. Do you have a movie from this year? Yeah, for, this is uh, uh, very similar slot? to it. There's a man who's at dinner in America, London, France. <laughs> the Batman. Uh, yes, just <laughs> right, right around nice. the corner to that one. The new reimagining, I guess, as the DCEU continues to restructure itself. Somehow movies like this still can... can can be made right in between the right if it's batman he doesn't count there's the batman who's over there connected <laughs> to everything and then there's the batman we've got joker coming out with a sequel dc is always going to have their almost like adult little label going on and i just absolutely adore what they did with the batman this year this was a movie that was made for imax specifically because of the sound uh it went anamorphic the entire time and was able to create some of the most insane visuals with the volume i think this showcased how we see a lot of movies that try to use it and just fail and we think that it's a matter of of precision or time it's talent this is what happens when you have a talented filmmaker going overboard with it they are able to create an entire town to create gotham and everything that we've known about it throughout all the years of having this character and create something new i think he was able to get to the heart of a character in a different way to see that a vigilante isn't just the justice they bring but how the fear you leave behind can also create exactly what you're fighting up against <laughs> come on bro it's batman and we had a great one this year. Let's do it. You know how long it's been since people so had no hesitation to say, yeah, this mopped the Dark Knight. We had so many Batman movies and this was the one where people had no problem saying it. I'm still with the Dark Knight just a little bit up above. But for the Batman mm-hmm. to have gotten that close, that did kind of scare me. And for that, it's in Impressive. the top five of my list. Also three hours, not? Nah? Yeah. it's Damn near? Yeah. Damn near. Yeah. A little three hours, two minutes. I know they wanted minutes, us to return like to that. theaters, but come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah, uh, could definitely use a hundred five minute <laughs> runtime right about now. But the Batman, great movie, uh, probably my standout superhero film of the year. It did not get the shortlist for best original score, which I know a lot of people were upset about. I don't get that. That Giacchino score was sick. Rips so good, uh, but it did get the sh- sound shortlist. As we you mentioned, should've... the sound in the film is excellent. Should get the makeup too for Colin. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so your number four is the Batman. Uh, my number four is another film that you love. It's Nope. So we'll talk about that one more later. We will. Um, I had I had some trouble deciding what to put here between my like number five, six, seven, and, and this one. But man, banger scene after banger scene had in to. Nope. I, I can't. It's undeniable. Uh, I'm glad. It's undeniable. I'm glad it topped your blockbusters right there. <laughs> All right, let's go to Amanda for her number three. Decision to leave. Uh, I caught it at, at Con, and it's just one of those ones that's nice. really stayed with me. Um, I think it does so much. Uh, again, you know, it's one of these things that at face value just looks like it's going to be like a procedural type crime thing, but then it goes so much deeper in terms of like the intimacy between these two characters, the little nuance between just little things like how they look at each other and just like the camera angle as it's getting on certain characters to let you know what's actually going on. Mm. And this man who knows that something's not quite right, but he's letting himself get pulled into this this situation and, and he wants to be pulled into this situation, but the whole time he, he's just trying to work his way around what he knows is staring him right in the face. But there's just like so much going on. Uh, it's I'm so excited to watch it again. It's one of the ones I really want to catch again uh, while I'm kind of like on a little bit of a holiday break. Uh, but I thought it was just so beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's so good. It's just a real powerhouse of a movie uh and i i recommend it to to anyone honorable thumbs up agreed it's on movie now best place to rewatch it yes movie yep yeah it's just some incredible shots in that one too i mean chanwick park is always a guy who uh is able to get some like very unsettling and uncomfortable and mm-hmm. and just striking visuals in his film but this year too like uh he, there's so many shots that are just like how I've never seen anything that yeah. quite looks like that. Yeah. So he's able to go I, I want to dive back into Decision to Leave. That's one of the ones I'm most eager to rewatch. Agreed. 
Okay, so let's go to Arturo's number three. Mm-hmm. Saw it at Sundance with all y'all at a little a little screening room and all these picks later. Following up Colin Farrell's supporting performance is Colin Farrell's Ooh. lead performance in After Ooh. Yang, the A24 Kogunata film. Uh, he previously made Columbus, which I absolutely adored. And for the most part... I think he came to bat just the same in a movie that feels like uh, the way that Zach broke it down. It feels like uh, several movies in one and you're just trying to follow the through line of what's happening with this family. But any members of this family can spin off and be their like almost own episode of what's going on within their lives mm-hmm. because everything's so lived in. Uh, it, it's one little movement of uh, a, a tick that a character has or where they play something in their shop, in their house, that you know it's a whole built world. There's dance competitions within this universe. There's this really cool poster uh, that they've done as an alternate for it where it's just like the layout of the house. And it just invokes the feeling of this movie, a movie that's covering a family of humans Mm. whose android assistant has broken down and uh, all the trouble that they do in order to fix it. And uh, (laughs) that premise is able to get into so many thematic nuances from all of the different characters that you meet, including Haley Lou's character, who plays a pivotal part, Mm. was also in Columbus. And I just loved everything about it. This is one where every single time you watch it, you notice something new. And that's because it comes from a craftsman. Kogonada continues to make amazing movie after amazing movie. And the craziest part is I still don't think he's made his masterpiece yet. Uh, that might be true because he is an extremely talented filmmaker that we've Fantastic. only gotten a glimpse of. Amanda, you had this at your number seven. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the things that you loved about After Yang? Uh, just kind of a lot of what Art said there. But again, I, I just really like this kind of like nuanced look at, at somebody kind of diving through someone else's memories and, and kind of reframing them uh, kind of in his own uh, perspective of how this person was and then taking that journey through their life after it's like too late to to talk to them about it, really. Um, yep. And it's just... Yeah. Uh, and we've had a couple just, of those. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's been a really big year for that and but it would the interesting part is that like you know between after yang and after sun it's so similar but they handle it it's handled so differently and the method of delivery is so different um but they're both like really spectacular in in their own way whereas like one's a little bit more sci-fi futuristic driven the other one's just very grounded and kind of taking Mm -hmm. a piece of past technology to the to the present um but yeah uh koganada is just he has a there's always a feel to a Koganata movie and, and what he does. Uh, and, and that just really rings mm-hmm. true here. Uh, it, it's just really just a powerhouse hitter. It just feels nice to watch. Like it just kind of like envelops you. It's kind of, it's just something that it just pulls, mm-hmm. pulls mm-hmm. you in as you're watching. So I thought it was like really spectacular. He's one of the best. Yeah. It's extremely aesthetically pleasing, but there's also just this like layer of real profound melancholy going mm-hmm. through it. And I think the the way that it uses the idea of memory to to construct its narrative is so fascinating. It it almost feels like reading the the diary of a of a deceased relative, yes. except transmorphed into like a future timeline. Mm-hmm. And and it's I don't know, it is really, really touching and beautiful. Um, I'm, there's a reason it's on all three of our top tens. Like it's just oh, a it film is that is nice. working so well okay. uh, in, on, in every facet, I feel like. And uh, just another one of the many strong appearances from Colin Farrell we've had this year. Colin Farrell, I feel like we could safely crown as the actor who won For 2022, 2022 right? Especially because he's about to come up in a little bit. 100%. <laughs> yep. All right. So, uh. Not quite yet, though. I'm going to go with my number three here, and that is Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which we talked about a little bit. But uh, I did want to add on that I've it's just been such a pleasure seeing Daniels emerge in this way and uh, mm-hmm. charting them from their music videos through uh, Swiss Army Man, which we once upon a time named as the best A24 movie know, on Intercut. The- uh, it, you saw to, what happened? To this, where you... <laughs> Swiss Army Man I used mean, we, to not be we, a Rotten Tomato approved movie, and then they magically make everything everywhere all at once, and critics went back to change it. We're going to leave it at that. Continue I just want Zach. the credit. Continues that because you're consistent. I just want the credit. We well, gave it a two out yeah. of five, but that's and a fresh review I, now. We've been champion Daniels. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> it's, easy, it's easy to just flip that switch. <laughs> But yeah, they've really just um, uh, managed to imbue this film with like every little bit of detail and nuance and 
uh, craftsmanship that you can imagine. Like every single frame of everything everywhere all at once feels like it's been poured over by some technician, some artist to make it as beautiful and as like evocative of all these m disparate ideas as possible. Like it's, it, it is the kind of film that almost feels like impossible to string together yet because they are so good at this maximalist style of cinema, it just feels like a piece in the end. And it's such a stunning achievement. I, I rewatched it this morning to make sure I had it at the right place on its list on this list. And it's so like, it's so simultaneously like overstimulating, but also soothing. Mm -hmm. And I just don't understand how that's quite possible, but Daniel's doing, that's all that matters. So uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. Number three on my list, I'm rooting for it at the Oscars, even though that will probably be the worst thing for this film's legacy. <laughs> it would be the worst uh, thing. But I love it. And I, I, I really just, yeah, I just kind of am happy to see them getting that like stamp of approval wider than they did on their last film, at least. Yep. It's also, like you said, the idea of a movie that's covering everything simultaneously is today's audience mm -hmm. it's today's world yeah. so if you're of the older head generation you're looking at this as some wacky zany what is this but i feel that the reason so many people have uh likened it is because they feel like they're the daniels they feel like they want to make it into this world to make something and this is closer and they see it be successful and they're like oh my goodness there's a there's a place for me and i think that this kind of showcases yeah. what it feels like to be on your phone you called it uh two feelings simultaneously at once the anxiety and the soothingness and i feel like we go mm -hmm. on our phones to be soothed to kill time and yeah. end up shutting the phone with everything that we just saw uh, that's happening online so it, it's the embodiment of the internet and i think that's why there's been such a divide for it but why so many people from today love it so much yeah. And it's also why I feel like there's so many different things that you could just pull out of the Easy. movie and talk about. Like, I, I love all the discussions that people have had about the representation of immigrant mothers in this mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. and, and what that's like being of different generations and how well this film depicts that. But that's also just like one small slice of all that happens in this movie. And I could see a version where you watch the movie and don't even really think about that because, again, it, it is everything everywhere all at once. So uh, a film we all loved and a film I got at my number three. But let's circle back to Amanda for her number two. This was hard. My number two and my number one were duking it out. Um, and I just kind of... I don't even know if this is the right choice, but I feel like my number one is also going to be your number one, Zach, so I'm going to hold off on it. So my number two, Cha-Cha Real Smooth, Ooh. which is so it's a, it's a simple little movie. Let's go. But we're, okay. big, we're big fans of Cooper Rafe here. We're big fans. Um, I might be the biggest fan, but he Zach just hates has him. such... Zach printed Zach out <laughs> in his house. It's just a punchy bag of Cooper Rafe. Slander and lies, <laughs> lies. and deceit. He's just got this Continue, way. Continue, Amanda. <laughs> he's got this way that he. It's like it's so wholesome and simple, and it should be cringy, but he just delivers things in a way that is so authentic that he gets away with it. He loves his mom, but he is so good at telling these stories that are like slices of time. It's like slices of how you feel when you're in college, first in college, and then Cha Cha Real Smooth is that what happens when you're out of college and you're trying to figure out what's next and like. Where do you make your own stand? How do you make your own place in the world? And how much easier it is just to try to integrate yourself into someone else's path, into someone else's life, and you know start the party for other people. But eventually, you got to start the party for yourself. And this was like a movie that kind of broke me out of a funk. Like when we were going at the Sundance, you know, all of these big franchises had like let me down. Scream! Like when I when I walked to the Scream Five, I was like, I think there's something wrong with me. I think I'm broken as a human being. <laughs> this is like not good. <laughs> I don't know if I can be happy anymore. Like, it was just really rough. And uh, Cha Cha Real Smooth just, like, broke me out hey, of Coop. that. In, in that nice little theater room at Sundance around all of you. I'm just sitting there on the ground bawling my eyes out watching this movie that is just so wholesome <laughs> and sweet and beautiful. Uh, it also stars uh, Dakota Johnson alongside Cooper Rafe. This time he wasn't even planning on being in the movie, but she said she'd only do it if he played the main character, Andrew. And I do actually Hound think that the movie is so much stronger for that. I know you're like, I think that's an excuse and he might have ended up in that position anyway, <laughs> but I believe that there is an intent. I believe there is an intent. 
Um, but everybody is really just like firing on full cylinders in this. And I think it's something that's like very relatable to like a type of person. If you relate to this movie, you're going to relate to it hard. So Cha Cha Real Smooth is my number two. Let the cringe live, bro. You have to. This is, it's another one of the movies that I feel like I've seen a lot of people really, really responding to this year and mm-hmm. really embracing. It's got the, just this sweetness and warmth to it that I think a lot of films would choose to be more cynical about or, or choose to be more saccharine about. And it somehow is able to be like both real and optimistic, which is a rare quality. Mm-hmm. And that's why some uh, people don't yeah, like I mean, it. Cooper's just... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that that's also why some people don't like this it. This has been that it's, year. It's where a quality. People that, will make movies yeah. like Zach was talking about Armageddon time. It's a guy venting about his past, and someone goes, "How dare you!" And then you got <laughs> Cooper Rafe's doing a little movie, like you said. This is a little period of time, some feelings that people have, and someone goes, "How mm-hmm. dare you!" I haven't had those feelings. And it's like you feel so bad for him. You're just trying to be vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Glad that you have Cha Cha Real Smooth on here because I know that's a lot of Inner Cuties favorites as well. Let's go to Arturo's number two. Are you going to go with the Spielbergian film or, or the, the Spielbergian Spielberg film? film. Uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, after this, I realized that I do, in fact, have two number or what is it? Two top five star films of the year. But at number Bro, two. Are you? Okay. I, I thought you were going to do another tie. No, I was not going to do another tie. <laughs> Although I am missing a movie. I am missing a movie. Both of these are movies about movies, and technically I missed the guy who did Whiplash doing a movie. I did not include him on my top list. Hopefully one of you guys have him. I'm going with Spielberg. The Fablemans is what I want to be the best picture of the year easily, but something just has to beat it ahead because I ain't traveled for Spielberg. I traveled for another one. But The Fablemans (laughs) is everything that you want out of the love letter to cinema genre that we've been getting. Nobody does it better. This is a movie where he has allowed his victory lap. Uh, I have always laughed when he discusses uh, Schindler's List being his student film because he never went to film (laughs) school and that's what he submitted when he finally did. He's got a better joke now, Zach <laughs> and Amanda. <laughs> During his TIFF run, he's so adorable. He said, I've never been at a film festival. This is my first film festival submission. Oh, no. <laughs> so for his debut, I want, I want everyone to know that Mr. Stevens Fableman is my favorite film festival film that he's ever released. I think he knocked it out of the park yeah. with it. And I think that for me, it speaks volumes onto uh, what I think should be considered one of the best movies of the year, not just covering a family who goes through turmoil and is able to make it up to the other end. It's a movie that discusses art, especially in a year where a lot of uh, you know doubt was cast upon the industry and whether theaters were going to survive or not. And also covers a lot of, uh, you know, different things dealing with hatred and such but uh i think there's a lot of beauty in this movie uh a lot of great homages to the past that not, don't just rely on spielberg it relies on everybody who's gone to the movies because if you've been to the movies you've seen a spielberg movie or something influenced by him and that's what makes the origins of where he got a lot of those ideas a lot of those influences but a lot of the heart and the reason why he makes movies to begin with uh it's one of the best movies of the year the fablements knocked it out of the park completely absolutely I feel like with Spielberg, you know, you can take so much for granted, right? Like the, every time you see a Spielberg movie, the cinematography is going to be off the chain. There's just going to be these unbelievable aspects to the production design. Anybody else does it, yeah, we'd be praising yeah. them. Mm, but like the thing with the Spielberg movie is sometimes you get that like you, you get that artistic uh, presence, but you don't necessarily have – like the reason for the movie to exist, right? Like we, when we saw the post a few years say. ago, we weren't that excited for it. And, and then like, we, we thought on, it was really, really good, really but good. it's also a little bit like it's, it's Spielberg kind of on autopilot Lincoln, a little bit, right? BFG. And like, yeah, like there's movies that are excellent, but it's also a little bit like, well, you can kind of just like put Spielberg on top of this story and it. he'll elevate it. This is the Finally. first time in a little while where it's been like he really needed to make this one. He's bringing his own passions like and that. persona and and ideas, and he's real. There's a very crucial reason for this movie to uh-huh. exist, and he is the only person who could have made only it. Only person. Um, I just love. I, I love the way that he talks about. Uh, control and getting control over these upsetting things in your life through the the 
make turning them into art. Um, I think there's a lot of like exercising of his own personal demons going on in this movie and that that messiness is part of what's really exciting about it. It's, it's a really good movie. We talked about it uh, in a after credits on this channel, so I don't want to uh, belabor the point. But yeah, Fable Wins One great. I had it as my number five of the year because it's it's. Yeah, just an excellent, excellent Really movie. good as well. Yeah, that was just, I, I caught that at TIFF. Actually, yeah, it was right next to Zach. So just a, just in different mezzanine little sections. But it, yeah. it's just, it's such a, like a really powerful <laughs> movie waved. all along. We waved. And I feel like there's like an interesting just dynamic in terms of like when you look at and you read some of like how he figured out things about his own life and how that would be ref- reflected in his art and like issues like, he would how it's he so interacted good. with his parents would in fact would affect how he made something like catch me if you can and then now this is kind of like a different framing of like that piece of his life with this added information that he has telling it in a different way in a different relationship to his parents but like the more authentic version i think it's just like it, it was really really personal and very awesome. very good the Fablemans, uh, number two on Arturo's top ten. My number two is actually going to be the same, I think, as Amanda's number one. So we can talk about them together here. It is The Banshees of Inishirin, Ooh. the latest yeah. film from Martin McDonough. A, a really uh, wonderful comedy slash tragedy about two lifelong friends who break up. And, and the consequences of that breakup. Uh, I just think that it, I love films that are able to take small ideas and, and small situations, the idea of these, these two friends who are in a rift, and then use that to talk about much larger ideas and tackle much more difficult questions. And that that the idea of like <laughs> this movie starting with, are you being a dick or are, are you actually kind of, do you have kind of have a point ending with, well, how are we supposed to live on earth? If not with each other, it, it's just <laughs> so smart and so profound in its very like understated way. And also just extremely hilarious throughout because Martin McDonough has this very sharp ear for comedy and the, the like sing songy nature of the Irish accents also mm-hmm. is great punctuation for, uh, for the comedy I, I, it's the kind of movie, the kind of movie that I look to the movies for. It's entertaining, but simultaneously moves me emotionally and, and makes me feel and think differently about things in the future. I just, uh, I think there's so much to like about it. Martin McDonough has always been one of my favorite writers, and this might be my new favorite Martin McDonough script. Wow! So I can't speak more highly about the Banshees of Inishirin. But Amanda, you have it even higher on your yeah. list than I do on mine. So uh, yeah. talk to me about why it's so special. So I, I feel like the word dramedy gets thrown around a lot, but I don't think there's a movie that is more like deserving of the title of dramedy than this. This perfectly mm-hmm. balances that comedy in with the drama of what's actually happening. And I know I already kind of mentioned Whiplash with the really obvious comparison with Tar, but the the question that's asked at like a root of Banshees is also like super relevant in Whiplash. It's this, that idea of like, is it better to be remembered or is it better to be kind and liked? You know, it is like what is and that's kind of like the, this mm-hmm. whole you know, epicenter of like, you know, whiplash is taking the hard stance of like, it is absolutely better to be remembered and like burn out in the blaze of glory if you need to. Whereas, you know, Banshees, we're kind of following the person who thinks, actually, I think it's better to be nice and kind and to be remembered by the people that I actually knew as being a good person, that type of thing. But uh, the question is still kind of out there for what you as a person might prefer. And just the the dynamic between... um, the two the two of them uh gleason and uh uh feral is just so oh. so good and then you've got like barry kyogen just kind of popping in with you know these like little little quips and <laughs> little things here and there and the the, the old idea that mm-hmm. like this the town thinks he's the dull one but then you know feral has to kind of come to the realization of what the rest <laughs> of the, the town thinks of him as we're kind of realizing it at the same time there's just so mm-hmm. much going on for this movie and I thought it was so good that it just starts so simple and then just crescendos into this huge massive situation while there's a Mm -hmm. literal war raging on across the ocean Um, but what's going on in this little town still somehow feels bigger so Banshees of Inishirin is my number one 
at least Amanda and I can agree on glad, the Banshees I'm of Inisher and Art. <laughs> I'm not believing Art didn't like things. it. I want to uh, one day I'll rewatch it. I'll love it as much. No, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I just didn't come out of it loving it as much as everybody else did. But I feel for me every year there's an island movie that doesn't resonate with me as well as everybody else does. One would have been uh, the lighthouse. <laughs> this year it's this. If they're speaking with an accent, it just takes me the third rewatch. So by the third rewatch, I'll be with you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. So if not the Banshees of Inisherin, what do you have at your number one? I think I know the answer, but Lao Lao Crockett. Uh, nope. Nope <laughs> is easily the movie of the year for me. Uh I when we first came out of it, uh was very skeptical that it had to be get out. And the more and more I've rewatched it, I've taken things out of it that expand to places that get out. Uh Never even attempted to go it. I think what Get Out was able to approach and with it being so tightly packed, was able to make an impact that, as we saw, entered the sight and sound list that shocked many. Mm -hmm. it, it being one mm -hmm. of what? One of three movies from the last decade that that, that arrived there. But Didn't with Nope, I think he's able to take it to the next level because you could see the... And Portrait too. Um, <laughs> but with this one, I think what you end up having <laughs> is a movie where you're following up a person after they found all the success that they've had and is letting you know being at the top of the industry what it's like being at the top of the industry he is in a sense the cameraman who knows he's at the top of the mountain he is the man who realizes what it's like to have that legacy continue um there's a part of it that not many people have caught which is the fact that the haywoods is the name of the family and that's the name of his grandfather that no one has connected from jordan peele himself so when you have characters saying don't mess with the haywoods it's his stamp on it. It's not just the legacy that Kaluuya wants to look back at his father. It's what he's looking at himself as well as a director, as a writer. And I think there's so much to it that you can pull not just as a sci-fi, as an homage to films from the past, as an homage to the filmmaking, but all of the different metaphors from the ship being an eye to uh, the, you know, with dealing with animals and the way that you deal with crews. Uh, there's so much in this movie that every time I watch it, I catch something new. And I think just the way that it shot has been one of the most exhilarating theater experiences of the year. I traveled eight hours to go see it. I saw it twice, though, so I don't think I traveled to just see it once. <laughs> and it was by far uh, one of the best projected movies put to screen. The technology that they created for this. Jordan Peele being the first time that he worked with the IMAX cameras, I think was able to elevate it to the next degree. And I'm excited to see him work with this tech. And I'm excited to see more actors appear in front of cameras that shoot this tech, if you know what I mean. And uh, easily, Nope is without a doubt my movie theater experience of the year and my favorite movie of the year, without a doubt. You know, a conversation that I've had with several people off of the podcast has been about whether or not Nope is a better movie than Get Out. And it, it's hard, I think, for me in particular, I, I did not want to discount the cultural impact, the cultural relevance of Get Out because there are few films of the past 20, 30, 40 years even that have had a bigger cultural impact than Get Out the way that it has it it has taken new words and put them into the vocabulary the, the way that the sunken place is now like a collective idea and not just a thing from a movie it, those are things that are hard to touch and hard to compare to and i don't know if jordan peele will ever make a movie that can do those things again but nope is probably a better movie and, and just on a scene to scene basis, he has really stepped up his game and, and has become such a master of creating suspense, creating atmosphere, layering his films with all these different ideas so that it does really reward endless thread pulling and endless pointing things out. I, I, I think he's gained so much confidence and gained so much ambition and, and the ways, the, the things he's trying to pull off in this film are so grander than what he was trying to pull off in Get Out. So even though I love Get Out and think it is like a indisputable classic, I'm starting to come around on the idea that Nope is actually the better of the two. I don't even, you said you feel bad comparing them and I don't think we should. I think we look back at his filmography decades from now as a Kubrick filmography. What's the best out of those? What's the one that you're supposed to right. like more? What's the one that you pick? You know, it's the whole collective at the end of it and what 
they all speak to each other. So uh, I think he cemented himself. I know that there's the idea of already seeing him as a class of his own and the Pileski and different things that he does. But I think he's delivered. And I think this is a movie that years, decades from now, we will be looking back on and it's going to be uh, iconic. Uh, so what were y'all mentioning Absolutely. when I, you all said uh, Portrait of a Lady? Oh, that's at like the 30. That's at like 29 on that list, Sight and Sounds. <laughs> It got even like, higher it, than yeah, Get Out. Yeah, it got way higher than Get Out. Oh, that's why. Right. Yeah, so I was like, it didn't be Portrait. <laughs> that's why people hated it. That's why people hated it so much. <laughs> that makes sense yeah. to them. Exactly. I was wondering why people were going so yeah. crazy over Portrait this last year. I was like, that's actually like the best possible one to have made it to the sight and sound. And it felt like the people <laughs> mm-hmm. complained about it were the people who hadn't seen it. What was Get Out then? Yeah. Uh, so Portrait, I think, was 30th. Parasite and Get Out were in the 90s. And what? Those were like the only three? From the past decade? From the past, like, 20 years, yeah. And did you see Get Out won the Screenwriters Guild? Like, best scripts of all time? No. You had to search that one up, it, even for really? writing Damn. Get Out with Snatch and Stuff Up. So, wow. Yeah, I mean, Peel, he is one of the filmmakers to look out for. I think he's in that league <laughs> of... Danny, he's in the league of... All the filmmakers who are shooting in 70s and, and, and IMAX. Yeah, Nolan. So uh, it's an event. He has become the event filmmaker. Cannot wait for another Jordan Peele movie. Uh, nope. is excellent. So uh, you have it at number one. I had it in my number four. But my number one, uh, let's get back to one that Amanda mentioned earlier. I have Tar. Todd Field's long-awaited follow-up uh, starring Kate Blanchett. Doing her her Daniel Day Lewis kind of kinda, right like this is sort of this is sort of show up and watch Kate Blanchett be the best actor in the world and for two and a half hours she is the best actor in the world in this movie uh, a film about a composer and the structure around her that allows her to maintain this position of power despite some bad deeds uh, or, or or are they bad deeds? It's something that we can argue about because this is a film that does not reveal easy answers. Instead, it just uh, asks you to sort of observe a lot of interesting situations and, and interesting predicaments and power dynamics and, and arrangements and, and asks you to have your own conclusions about what's justified and, and what, uh, did people reap what they sowed here? I think there's no film that does a better job of commenting on the way that celebrity works in the modern day and also how these institutions operate. It, it's so interesting in how it's able to slowly reveal that that's sort of what this film has for like a central driving premise, but it, there's so much going beyond the idea of cancellation in this film. Like you could just talk about what's literally happening in the film between her job and her family and whatever, or you can talk about like what's metaphorically going on in the film. Like, like the ghosts have, mm-hmm. has anybody had like a, a good conversation about the ghosts that are in this movie. It, it's, it's a fascinating movie. Uh, I just, I cannot stop talking about it to anybody who wants to. I think it is so interesting in every scene you can pull out these details. Um, I've watched it a couple times and I want to watch it more. I, I just, it is so masterful and I get what people are saying when they think that the ending is a little bit elongated, but they're wrong. It's perfect. It's so funny. It's so <laughs> It's so good. funny. It's so funny. It's, it's the hardest I've laughed at anything all year. Uh, I love it so much. So and good. I just love this movie. I love this movie so much. It's I I saw the first time I saw it, I thought it was brilliant. The second time I saw it, I thought it was like one of the most masterful things I've ever seen. Did you ever get to go it's see it with a sickle at 12 a.m.? <laughs> yeah, man, I did it. I, I me and like we kept weird single opening weekend after we saw it in New York, we couldn't find a regular screening. By that I mean you go in there and every weirdo just has to pick the weirdest seats. Like you knew that if he needed yeah. to take a bathroom break, all of those weirdos would have not followed the urinal rule. They would have all been like in line for the one urinal. The way they were seated, we pulled they were, up. Amanda, they were seated in a line yeah. in front of each other. We pulled up a list. What? Yeah, it was it was just a straight line down the middle of the theater of single it was like the people inspection. going yeah, to see Yeah, they were like tar. military just <laughs> It was weird. Was they it were in playing 3D? Connect Did 4? they think they like, needed to be on. dead set? <laughs> Just stagger, no. right? Like stagger yourself a little bit. It was weird. It was crazy. I, I was I was worried to go to that movie. 
the movie screen. Yeah. Goes. Anyway, me and all the weirdos, we love Tar. It's really great. Amanda, what'd you think about it? I thought it was great. I finally <laughs> caught up with it today, so I'm so excited to catch it again because I know awesome. there's so much that I'm gonna like pick up on on a second viewing. But that was like the biggest mm-hmm. disappointment. My theater's been doing this bullshit thing where they've been putting up posters in like the coming soon section, and then the movie doesn't come. It doesn't come. They did it with Tar. They did it with mm. Fableman. Ugh. There's like a couple other ones they've done. Jesus. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you bothering to put the poster up if you know you're not going to do anything with it? And then it's like a toss up. <laughs> it's coming soon it. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, we're getting Tar <laughs> soon. And fucking Lyle Lyle shows up. Like, come on. But uh, yeah, no, this is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, really it's just powerful powerful performance like i'm already too many mentions of lyle lyle on this podcast for the best of the year terrible i'm sorry (laughs) but it's like just kate blanchett is already what have you done art (laughs) just such a phenomenal actress she is and uh this was like gotta be like her best probably her best performance or at least it's one of them it's just this full tour de force it's been really interesting to see people I think take so. what i think is just like the very wrong takeaway from it i swear to god people read the premise and they're just kind of like oh see <laughs> <laughs> the woke media is on That's my side now thing. too they're not watching it they're I bringing in their how... stuff into it yeah i love how much this movie is breaking people's brains Rorschach. the takes that have come out of this film are hilarious and sometimes hilariously wrong and i don't like to say people are wrong about movies often but a lot of you are wrong about tar it's 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 beautiful i, I love that todd field is messing with people in this way yeah um, it, it she's easy the best so yeah we talked about fablemans and i yeah. and we had talked about especially in the after credits how much i loved uh for the mom for Williams', Williams. performance, and I think she should definitely get yeah. nominated. Michelle Williams is great in it, and and even Corio, who you were talking about for After Sun, I agree with you. One of the greatest like child performances, one of the great performances of the year. Mm-hmm. She isn't fair. You can't pull up and do this in Tar. Yeah, like there's just you don't even know if she Steph is scripted man. in this movie. She seems to be going off the cuff. Yes. <laughs> It's nasty. She like ad libs a song and then gets credited at the end. And I think she made it up on the spot with like a like a two. Yeah. I don't even know what she was playing. The accordion. Uh, accordion. Yeah, no, she's just I, Zach put it well. She's just doing her 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 Daniel Plainview here. She's just messing around. It's a victory yeah. lap for her. So she's in her bag. Yeah, Tar, my number one film of twenty twenty two. Uh, so many good movies this year. We we didn't mention our honorable mentions. Uh, Amanda, I don't know if you want to get to yours, if you have yeah. a list or something. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Worst Person in the World was kind of a toss-up, whether it would be last year or this year. So I just took it off the main list, but it's still fantastic. Same. Uh, yeah, Emily the Criminal is another strong one. Um, I really like Bullet Train. I know a lot of people didn't, but it's such a chaotic movie, and it's my kind of chaotic. Uh, Close was a really good one. I saw that one Close at, at Con. Uh, pleasure was good. Was one that we we enjoyed um, back at. That uh, is that is the mid one. At, uh, oh. at Sundance, yeah. So that one's a rough one to get through. And then uh, I really enjoyed Fresh. But then my kind of like what I enjoy one of the ones I enjoyed the most that I watched this year that doesn't have a release date yet is Sanctuary, starring uh, Christopher Abbott again and Margaret Qualley. So. Want to catch that one? Yeah. Uh, Art, did you have any more honorable mentions? I know you mentioned yeah. a couple of them. Uh, of I don't think we were able to give a shout out to The Fallout, but The Fallout was a movie that ended up hitting mm-hmm. HBO, and I thought it had some really good performances from his cast as they deal uh, with... On a, my honorable mentions, too. Yeah, a, you know, a, a school incident that happens. Uh, some of the other ones would have been like Corsage, that I know is getting a release right at Christmas. We were able to catch that at New York, and I think it's an interesting way of not just looking at... It got shortlisted today. Let's go! Because uh, mm-hmm. that's not just yeah. a movie where Vicky Krebs is playing royalty and, and how she's going to survive that. It's like also a movie about us going from portraits to the moving image and how that screwed a lot of people over because mm-hmm. they could paint themselves the way they wanted to and the moving image mm-hmm. wasn't lying. So I really like that one. Uh, Bones and all. I don't think anyone gave a mention, mm-hmm. mention here, but I got <laughs> I got those little postcards that they sent uh, oh, nice. from AMC. <laughs> so I, I, I thought it was a pretty interesting it. movie. Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul, Turning mm-hmm. Red. Guillermo Great Toto's one. Pinocchio. Um, and if we were to get into some ones that I think were... Uh, were we going to make that video of the kind of movies under the radar? Let's do it. Let's do it? Like, you want me to name my list or are we doing the video? Yeah. 
We'll do the video. We'll do the video. All right. So I'll save some there, but yeah. uh, I will double up on Athena, which Zach had mentioned earlier. And that was one of those that almost slipped under my radar and ended up having some of the best cinematography specifically meant for you to watch at home. And I really love that about it. So uh, those would have been some of the picks that I had. What about you, Zach? Uh, I had Bones and All on my list as well. Uh, I like that one quite a bit. Something in the Dirt. We talked to Moorhead and Benson on the show. I really enjoyed that one out of Sundance. I got Top Gun Maverick, but thankfully you mentioned that one. I got The Northman. That's uh, Robert one. Eggers' Viking epic. I want to rewatch that one as well as 13 Lives, the Ron Howard story of the Thai cave rescue that I was not expecting to like quite as much as I did. That That's a really great movie that went way under the radar. Uh, the Fallout, I, I have it here because it kind of kept climbing on my list. I, I find myself thinking about it more than I expected to when we first caught that at South by Southwest. It's a really powerful film. Um, I, I wanted to put White Noise on my list. Do I know it. not a, a lot did. of people are loving that one, but I it's fun and goofy and it makes me laugh. The movie I really wanted to find a spot for but couldn't was Hustle because that's the movie that most feels like it was made for me and, and movie starring Adam Sandler <laughs> as a basketball scout in Philadelphia. Like, come on. Uh, but uh, alas, I couldn't. And then my hardest cut, was women talking that that's mm. the movie that really should be in my top 10. That is a, that's actually a good maybe one. I need to rewatch that. It's, it's been a couple months since I, I caught it. It's a really great movie, a really great uh, film from Sarah Pauly. Um, and then like Amanda, I also decided to leave worst person in the world off my list just because I've, I've mentioned it enough on the show, but it, it probably would be like right around number two, number three for me. Question. Mm -hmm. Babylon. Yeah. Haven't seen it yet. I see it on you Friday. Know, I think I want to watch it again before I seriously oh, consider it for damn. a top a top ten slot. Okay. But it's it's a lot. It's fun. I'm gonna give it the uh, honorable it's mention. Memorable. I don't know when we're allowed to talk okay. about it because they gave us weird embargoes, but uh yeah. Damien Chazelle's <laughs> new movie as well. But a lot of great picks. What uh what did you guys end up having or what I guess three ways, what did we end up having the most crossover with? After Yang ended up on all three of our lists. And Everything Everywhere All at Once, I think, is also on all three of our lists. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, nice. we got Tar on two lists, Banshees on two lists, Fableman's on two lists, and Nope on two lists. Beautiful. So maybe a little more. I think that's a little bit more crossover than normal for us. There's just a couple undeniable movies this year. <laughs> stuff like uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once Easily, and, yeah, yeah. and Banshees and Nope. Yeah. So a lot of great picks from uh, the best of 2022 so far. You can uh, catch up with our lists on social media. Uh, but let us know what your favorite movies of 2022 are in the comments down below or by shooting us an email at intercutpod at gmail.com. Com. That's about all for this edition of the podcast. Follow me, Zach Shevich, on Twitter, Instagram, or Letterboxd at ZShevich, the Z S H E V I C H, and check out my YouTube or TikTok channels at Multiplex Show. Amanda, where can people find more from you? You can find me on YouTube, Twitch, Letterbox, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and a bunch of other places at Amanda the Jedi. All right, where can people find more from you? You can find me over at Elmi Explain on Twitter, on YouTube, on Letterboxd, or every week here on the Intercut Podcast. You can listen to every episode of the Intercut Podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, whatever your favorite podcatcher is. I like Overcast. And then make sure you subscribe not just to the audio feed, but to the video feed as well on YouTube.com slash IntercutPod. We catch our bright, smiling faces as we break down the latest in entertainment. Find new episodes of our weekend must-watch every Monday on the channel. And please leave a comment, like the video, consider heading over to iTunes to give us that much-requested five-star review. Uh, also, like our Facebook Follow our Instagram, follow our Twitter, support our Patreon. You can find all of them at Intercut Pod to get updates throughout the week from Art, from Amanda, from me, from all the guests that we feature here on Intercut. Thanks again for tuning in. And until next time, it's not until I conducted that I became convinced all people are capable of murder.